Welcome to episode 32. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Who Did That Voice, where we take an in-depth look at voiceovers. It's a new year, and if you're like me, you are already thinking about warmer weather and taking that getaway to that tropical or exotic destination. Maybe you plan to travel to Walt Disney World or Universal Studios. No matter what kind of trip you plan, 3D Travel Company is the company for you. Just visit 3DTravelCompany.com and let them know that Trenton sent you from Who Did That Voice. Or you can book on www.whodidthatvoice.co and click the Book Now button. For a limited time, Who Did That Voice listeners can receive a Disney gift card for qualifying Disney and Universal trips booked and traveled by the end of 2017. Book today and travel away. Welcome to Who Did That Voice, the show where we take an in-depth look at voiceover. And now, here's your host, Trenton Larkin. Hey everyone, and welcome back to the show. Happy 2017. This is our very first episode since the new year, and uh, we are going to kick it off with an amazing interview today that you will not want to miss, along with a great lineup coming in the months and days and year ahead. So to begin, our special guest comes all the way from outer space, wears gold, has wings, and hates the Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. Yes, folks, we have Goldar from Mighty Morphin Power Rangers. You will soon pledge your allegiance to me. <laughs> no way, Goldar. No way. We shall soon see the Do you even recognize yourself, Tommy? Do you see what a gallant hero you used to be, Green Ranger? Our special guest has not only had the opportunity to play one of the most revered and loved villains of all times on Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, but he has also gotten to play one of the Super Rangers from Power Rangers Lost Galaxy. That's right, he played Magna Defender. Time to finish what we started. Magna Defender? Zika? You will carry on the work we began. My weapon is now yours. You will be the Magna Defender. Me? It is your destiny. This next show our special guest is from is one you may not be as familiar with. After Knight Rider, a show came out called Team Knight Rider that had five vehicles that all had AI, artificial intelligence, talking vehicles, of course, just like Michael's original car kit. So this car our special guest got to play was called Beast, which was a modified Ford F-150. If you haven't seen the show, check it out. Here's a clip of Beast. We have to destroy the virus. Beast? My incendiaries have a mile range. They'll fry the pilot as well. Do it. Jim, we have to. If that virus gets out, millions of people will die. Okay, Beast, take it down. It's almost out of my range. I hope I can still leak it. Well, our special guest is no stranger to working with Saban Entertainment. Another special character he got to play was Jeb the Dog from VR Troopers. Something strange happened while I was gone? You mean besides everybody dancing like they're stuck in guacamole? Yeah, besides that. Well, some babe did put a CD in the jukebox just before the zombie thon started. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Did That Voice? Today on the show, we have the golden voice of Kerrigan Mahan. Kerrigan, thanks so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you, Trent. Kerrigan, the very first thing we like to do when we have a new guest on the show is just to get a little background on who you are, uh, you know, just as an individual and as an actor. And how did you get into the voiceover industry? Wow. We could spend, I guess, um, I, won't bore, I won't bore you or, or the audience with, uh, you know, with taking it from the top or the beginning, as it were, but uh, that's a whole show in and of itself, I suppose. Um, you know, I'm three generations this crazy Hollywood, uh, meaning, you know, my dad was a child actor and my, my grandma was a right arm to, to a big producer. And um, so I, we weren't 18, as it were. You know, we weren't uh, we weren't the creme de la creme of Hollywood. We weren't on the we weren't on the flats of Beverly Hills. We were in Playa del Rey. But I don't know if it's any different. 
quite frankly, all the only discussions, the only things anybody talked about in my family was the business, the business, the business, the business, and, and, and that was mixed with cars. So that's what I grew up with, talking about the business, and, 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 and the default was cars. Okay. So, <laughs> if, that, <laughs> if, that, if that sheds any light on your question, I don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and none of, none of what you're thing, telling us one, is a bore, so. <laughs> one thing I can share for certain is one would think three generations Hollywood and growing up with what I just shared you would have some idea or some understanding of how Hollywood works. And I can tell you flat out, I don't know any more about how Hollywood works than anybody else out there that is not in the business. It is the most nonsensical, crazy, befuddling business there is. And, you know, all this shrouded mystery that surrounds it, uh, there's a reason for that. That, that Hollywood doesn't want the layman to know just how, just how crazy and nonsensical it really is. So we shroud it in this mystery of, ooh, and it's like, no, 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 don't overthink this, guys. You know, chances are, you know, I went to a screening of a very famous director from Czechoslovakia. Nobody would know his name. Uh, here today or yesterday. And I remember talking to him after the screening and I said, you know, my gosh, what, it really was an artful film. And I said, Jetty, his name was Jetty Weiss. I said, how, I mean, I can't believe you got that shot with the Ferris wheel and behind the Ferris wheel was that shot of the billboard with, and then it actually said, the billboard actually said whatever it said, I don't remember it, but I, I said the metaphor was absolutely brilliant. And he looked at me and he says, Gary, Gary, my friend, Gary, I did not see the billboard in the shot the bill post production. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so there, there you have it, you know? I mean, you know, you know, we put it all on this, ooh, wow. Look at the, look at it, look it up there, so brilliant. And it's like, mm, mm, yes. And then sometimes it's all happenstance. So on that note, I knew I wanted to be an actor at probably nine years old when I did a little skit in the third grade. And <clears throat> I know my parents hoped and begged, please, no, 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 let's Let's go V to school. Let's get a. Let's go to BMI. Uh, Frank McCarthy, who produced Patton and was my grandma's boss. Oh wow! You know, he had a uh, and and MacArthur. He he had a, uh, you know he was a v, BMI graduate, and of course everybody said, let's get him into BMI. Frank, can we do it? Oh yes, yes. And I'm like, I'm not going to no VMI. I'm not <laughs> going to VMI. I, I, I'm going to be an actor. No, 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 God, no, God, no, 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 no. You can't do that. <laughs> like, you know, I, 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 news flash guys. <clears throat> yes, I am. And my dad says, oh, come on now. You've got to get a backup. You've got to have a backup. You, you, you've got, you know, go to plumbing school. Uh, you know, and I watched a plumber actually put a new sink in my house about a year ago, a new uh, faucet on his back and cutting his elbows and, and trying to get the tools up there. And I found myself literally standing there thinking, Holy crap, thank God I didn't listen to you, Dad. <laughs> that, that just looks horrible. <laughs> <laughs> wow. And, you know, there was a point, there was a point where my dad kind of succumbed when he, when he realized, you know, and he didn't like it. He, he realized, oh, my God, you're making more money than, in a year than I've made in a lifetime. And, <laughs> you know, that was, that, was, that was the end of it. I wound up jumping from on camera by accident into voiceover. My uh, girlfriend was working at a, a very elite restaurant, takeout kind of sit down, fancy little restaurant called Pasta, etc. And it was on um, the Sunset, Sunset Strip in Sunset Plaza. And she worked late. And, you know, it was kind of high-end pasta for the rich people. You know, you're hungry at 12 midnight, you come to pasta, et cetera, and get some fancy. You know, it was like a fancy high-end Italian deli, yeah. basically. And, 
she comes home one night and says, oh, my gosh, you're never going to believe it. This guy came in, and, and he said, I have a great voice, which she did. She was a blues singer. I'm not doing a very good imitation of her. She has a whiskey, great voice. And and they said they were recording right down the street, and blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, Wanda, good God, he was hitting on you. Nobody's recording at midnight. <laughs> well, as it turned out, uh, yes, they were recording, and they were recording at a at a studio called Intersound, and they were recording a lovely uh, <clears throat> anime cartoon called Robotech. Oh, wow, yeah, I know it. And that's how I wound up in Robotech. I went down with her the next day, and we met Greg Snagoff, and we watched him dub, and I thought I'll never be able to do this, and Wanda took a crack at it and didn't do very well. And I took the crack at it, and if ever, if ever, I can recall my heart beating harder or faster. You know when your heart beats so hard that you can actually feel it in your ears? Have you, have you ever had that? I mean, it's you really have to be... Yes, I know what you mean. ...either really scared or whatever, whatever is happening there. I mean, I'm feeling my heart beat in my ears, and my ears are hot. That's how nervous I was. You know, and and at the time we didn't have beeps, what are called beeps. You you know, in in looping and ADR, you have three imaginary beeps that are are metered, and uh, the fourth imaginary beep is when you go. Well, we just went to a red light in the day, as it were, and uh, I I caught on to this very quickly, and before I knew it, I was working. They were hungry for talent. I guess I had what they were looking for, and uh, the second generation I was cast as Private Sean Phillips, which really was, I'd have to say, really the beginnings of my voiceover career was was really, I, I mean, there were certainly bits and voila and other little things I'd done, and, and certainly on-camera TV stuff I had done, but this was the beginning of my voiceover career was, in fact, Private Sean Phillips on Robotech. Well, that's very fascinating. I really appreciate you sharing that with us, you know, kind of giving us the beginnings of how you got into it. When Power Rangers came about and you auditioned for that role, did you know that you were auditioning for Goldar in Power Rangers? In answer to, to Goldar and Power Rangers, we were all kind of a troupe, an acting troupe, uh, having dubbed hundreds of shows and anime, and Saban came marching into town, had a little, uh, nothing, little offices on Ventura Boulevard at Colfax in Studio City. And uh, somebody discovered him, I think Doug Stone, uh, another fellow actor, uh, voiceover guy, and, and Doug was Canadian, I think, but Doug somehow sussed out uh, the Saban character. And and then I, I guess Bob Barron wound up taking a meeting with Hyam, because uh, we were the dubbers. We were, we were it. We were, you know, I say we. There were probably only a hundred of us in town uh, that really were the, the, the people that did all of the dubbing, not just the anime, but all the foreign film dubbing, too. So a very close-knit group. Uh, yeah, very close-knit, yes. So we wound up dubbing a lot of his stuff, and he didn't know what he, well, I say, he, that's not fair. I, I say he didn't know what he was doing. He, he was a strange man in a strange land. And he, he had hits with music in Europe, in, uh, in, in Europe with, with cartoons and stuff. And his background was kind of music with Shuki Levy. Uh, so he acquired some stuff from Japan and we dubbed a lot of his stuff. Uh, Maple Town and I, oh, I can't even begin to name all of the, all of the, the things we, we dubbed. And so, in answer to your question, long, long way around it, but we did not audition. None of us auditioned. Okay. Tony Oliver called in the group that you actually wound up seeing. I don't know if you're aware of it, but we are, as of yesterday, I believe, 23 years since Power Rangers aired. Yeah, it's amazing. It's really amazing how long it's been around. I, I know I grew up with it, and it's been a huge part of my life, So as it has for other people, too. So, And we did not know we were doing that when we made it. We had no idea. We had no idea. So anyway, in answer to your question, uh, Tony Oliver, who uh, played um, 
Um, I'm embarrassed to say I can't say the lead role that he played in Robotech. He wound up changing hats and became a producer for Saban, and he actually uh, <clears throat> reeled in his choices for all of these characters. And at the time, it was uh, it was a, an, an unsold pilot, and so we all crammed into a really very small studio. And uh, I think I'm not even I don't even believe we were at that studio at the time when we, I think it was another little studio in town. And he said, Dave, you play this Babu character and Michael, why don't you play that blue character called Squats and Barbara, um, go ahead and do this Rita. She's kind of a witchy thing. And so basically we all just kind of did these characters. And, and Tony said to me, there's this guy character, kind of a, monkey lion but no i don't think he has much of a part uh just throw some some nasty voice on him care um i said okay great and i did i think in the pilot he had two two lines and we laughed and so many weeks later tony called everybody and said hey this thing sold and we're all kind of like what thing that Power Rangers thing, you guys came in and did the, oh, yeah, yeah, oh, did it, oh, okay, uh, oh, okay, oh, shit, okay, so, so, we did the pilot, and then I only had a couple, you know, again, a couple lines, so I didn't take this part, you know, too seriously, it's like, it was a job, and whenever I was called to come in and do it, I went in and did it, but... About 16 episodes, 15, 15, about 14 episodes in, Tony called me uh, at home and said, Hey, uh, your character, Goldar, uh, we've just discovered has a huge part. <laughs> I said, R Really? Yeah, yeah, really. And I don't know what you're going to do, but you have a lot of lines. And uh, it sounds to me like whatever you're doing is hurting your voice. I said, Yeah, I'm not really paying much attention to it. It's not. You know, I didn't think there was anything. I, okay. Well, I had a little basement in my house, and I went downstairs and spent about an hour and a half uh, perfecting the voice and getting it where it was actually twice or three times bigger and scarier. And, you know, I rolled a lot of vocal over the cords and put a lot of air into it. And I said, wow, I'm, I'm happy with it. I, I'm, I like it. And they said, whatever you're doing, we love it. And we were off and running, and that's why people say to me to this day, "Who? It seems like um, in the beginning it was different." And it's like, well, in the beginning it was. <laughs> 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 so I think it was seventeen through twenty-one, Green with Evil. Oh yeah, I think that was the name. Is that correct, Trenton? Yeah, Green, Green with, with evil? evil. Yeah, that's when Tommy kind of came on the scene, and oh yeah, love the Green Ranger. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that's when I, you know, when I realized, oh boy, this is a big role. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Goldar was one of my absolute favorites. Well, it was a lot of fun to record, and uh, that being said, the five-parter was the beginning of the big new voice, and uh, I had it down. I knew, you know, what I was doing with the voice, and I had, you know, headsets that were good and loud and I liked them to be just a certain volume so I could hear what I was doing and, and I was good for about 45 minutes without straining or hurting so I could go on to do another job and that's the way Goldar worked and we did not record any longer than 45 that was about it now that's not to say there wasn't a day here or there where you know Scott would say how you coming and I said I'm all right and he said because we're you know you're past 45 minutes I said yep I said, and I'm fine. How much to finish up? Ten more lines. Let's finish. Or the other way. No. You know, some days there'll be 30 minutes. And that's like, you know what? I'm at the end of the line here. Let's finish this up and I'll have to come back. Because, I, you know, I had to go on to do other jobs. Well, I know, you know, working with Saban, you also got to work on VR Troopers, which was similar to Power Rangers in its concept. But you actually got to play Jeb the dog, who was kind of their, I don't know, mascot of sorts on the show. I think he was the mascot. And I think also, <clears throat> along with um, uh, the young man whose the name escapes me, I apologize, uh, uh, who was my master, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> He, you know, we were, I'd have to say we were the, uh, 
we were the bulk and skull, if you will, of, of VR Troopers. I think it was one of the most fun roles I played. I brought Jack Nicholson to the role. Um, I was asked to do the role. I didn't audition for it, and nobody had any idea what to do with the dog. And uh, I said to Scott, does anyone really have any idea? I mean, are we, are we just, is it an open, a blank palette, if you will? Okay. And he said, yeah, they don't know what to do, and we've called you, they called you specific, meaning nobody else was called in to do Jeb that I'm aware of, uh, you know, to kind of start to play around with, with him. I said, okay, uh, why don't we look at a little of, of, of some of the footage, and we did. I said, well, Scott, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw Nicholson on him. <laughs> but I said, oh, my God, that's hilarious. I said, I don't know, I don't know if they're going to bite on it because, you know, I don't know what kind of legal we're looking at. He said, well, let's do some variations and, and definitely do Jack. So I knocked down Jack and I knocked down a few other voices, which I couldn't even begin to tell you what they were. I had no idea. Although somebody played me something just a, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I think it was at Power Morphicon or wherever I was and said, <clears throat> I, uh, oh yeah, it was. It was. It was. Uh, it was Cody, the kid who was helping me, uh, hand, my handler, and he said, "Did you ever see this Jeb footage of a commercial or something? Something?" And he showed it to me, and he said, "Whose voice is that?" I said, "That's me, Cody." <laughs> he said, "That's you." But the point being, I obviously did a different voice completely <clears throat> at some point. <laughs> that was, I guess, being considered. But there was a lot of ar not arguing. There was a lot of um, concern initially as to whether we were going to have a problem with uh, with Jack. And I said, you know, I, I think I have to identify myself as, you know, Jack. You know, and this is always gray area when you start Im impersonating a, a high-end celebrity. But they said, look, in the meantime, let's just record it. And uh, the meantime turned into the real time, and that was the <laughs> end of it. Uh, I guess I guess the attorneys um, looked into it enough to whatever degree, or we all recorded and waited to see if Jack was going to come forward. Nobody came forward, and that's that's the story of Jeb the Talking Dog. Well, I really appreciate you sharing that with us because I know growing up a lot of the different Saban shows were definitely my favorites. And I had no clue that you played that role until more recently. You know, as I've kind of asked myself the question, who did that voice? And I've kind of looked into people who were the actors behind the voices. You know, I've discovered all kinds of wonderful things, and including the fact that you played not only Goldar, but Jeb on VR Troopers, which was another favorite of mine, even though the show didn't run as long as uh, Power Rangers. But, uh, you know, it definitely was fascinating. Trenton, how long did, did it go... Did it go two or three seasons? Um, you know, I... I, 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 think, I think it only made two. And, and quite frankly, I think the show deserved... I think it was a pretty decent show. I'm, I've not revisited it. And I know, I, I've been told, it's running on Netflix as we speak. And um, I'm going to have to... I'm going to definitely have to go look. Because, uh, you know, this is, I've never seen the show since I did it. Absolutely. Yeah, it did run two seasons, Kerrigan. And I agree with yeah. you. It didn't run long enough. Um, you know, in fact, the pilot, you know, Jason David Frank actually played in the pilot as the original VR Trooper. Uh, I don't know if you remember yeah. that or not, but. So VR Troopers, um, I yes, Brad Hawkins, Brad Hawkins did tell that story. I did not realize uh, just up until a con that he and I were at recently as a matter of fact it may have been power morphicon that i just heard for the first time i did not realize that uh uh that jason was originally uh scheduled to play that role and he told the uh he uh, brad told the whole story of of how that unfolded and uh it was pretty darn interesting and anyway i thought the show and i and i saw michael for the first time at um power morphicon I have not seen Michael in 20 years, and I just saw him at Power Morphicon for the first time in 20 years, and, and I, gosh, it was fun. It was so much fun. It really was. It was just so much fun. The whole thing is bloody surreal. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. Well, I appreciate you sharing that. That's, you know, it's good to know those inside stories. So with Brad taking over the role, was it kind of one of those things where they decided Jason would be better on Rangers 
And then they brought Brad in, or how did that transition end up happening? Since Jason, I think it's something. I, I think it's basically as you just as you just said. They were they were doing uh, they were shuffling. They were shuffling. Okay. I think Brad actually was scheduled uh, to be you know the Green Ranger, uh, as I recall the story. Okay. And uh, they flip flopped it. They decided Brad, I think, was going to be better uh, on VR Troopers and. You know, uh, the rest is history. Absolutely. <laughs> well, Brad did make an excellent leader for that group, and that was a fascinating show. And like you said, it ran too short, unfortunately. So. Yeah, I thought so. And, and you know, recording the dog was so much fun. And I have to <laughs> say, too, I was given tremendous liberties in rewrites, which so often is the case. You don't get to touch the writing. And in our case, between Scott and me, we tore into those lines on a regular basis. So in all fairness, dare I toot my own horn, as we used to say, <laughs> a lot of those lines are mine. You know, I mean, I'd have to look back and see it again and, and say, oh, gosh, that's my <laughs> line. That's my line. That's not my line. Uh, I should have rewritten that line. <laughs> <You> <laughs> know? Yeah. Um, but we, we had a lot of fun, and that's another thing that people don't often realize how much fun we had in the studio, and Scott Page Pagter was everything, everything anybody could ever ask or wish for. I'm talking about loose, 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 fun, 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 completely carrying on. It was a party where the work somehow was completely accomplished and accomplished efficiently while partying, if that makes any sense. <laughs> I absolutely understand. I do. Yeah, it was really a great time, a great time. Well, you know, just real quick, I was thinking about like the VR Troopers and all the Power Rangers. Now, especially initially when the Rangers came to America, a lot of the actors we saw here in the States, they actually did voiceover for their characters as well. Is that correct? Uh, the actors in the states, yes, yes, yes ADR work, correct. and okay. Oh yes, they yeah. were. We passed, we passed each other on a regular basis. Yes. Okay, and I thought that was the case because so much of the footage was Japanese, and I know now they've kind of gone to where they're filming their own, and um, I think Australia now. But um, that's what I was kind of thinking was originally there was a lot of ADR work because of all the Japanese footage, and so Tommy and all the other Rangers were actually voicing their own characters. I mean, Jason as Tommy. Oh, yeah, yeah, so. yeah. No, they were all voicing their characters. And, I, you know, there's still all the ADR work. It, it's all ADR, you know, when they're in the suits. So, you know, they're, they're still ADRing that because the sound out there is, is terrible, and in the suits it's terrible. So that's all done in the studio regardless. Well, and that's something I'd always thought, but I had never had any confirmation on it. And I just, you know, since the show is about voiceover and that ADR is part of voiceover, it kind of was something I was fascinated with and had always wondered as a kid. So it's, it's actually a very big aspect of voiceover, and most people don't know much about it at all. You know, looping is a whole area of voiceover that people have no idea. There are loop groups that go in and do all the background and all, you know, with the guys that are on a phone machine when someone comes in and they hear a couple first or, you know, all the background or the cabbie going, uh, you know, all that stuff is done on a stage. None of the extras on a set are talking. They are not talking. Well, you know, speaking of other shows that you've done voiceover work for, you got to be a part of the Knight Rider franchise in the show that came out about 10 years after the original show called Team Knight Rider, and you played a Ford F-150 named Beast. You were the artificial intelligence voice. What was it like being a part of that franchise and working with that team of individuals? Again, single tracking, uh, wonderful producers, just wonderful producers. Uh, they really let me go crazy, and we're getting back to getting to rewrite. Um, in fact, I remember very clearly sitting there and and uh, looking up and saying, can I say bite me? <laughs> and they said, y y uh, what did you want to do? Uh, this line coming up instead of what you have there, uh, which I don't remember, uh, but can I say bite me, Linda? And they said, yeah. Let's record it both ways, but I love Bite Me. Okay, great. <laughs> well, I got to do that all the time. So, again, a lot of my Attack Beast lines were my lines. 
I didn't get paid for my lines, but <laughs> <laughs> they were paying. That show, I was being paid very handsomely. It was a very good gig, and uh, my biggest regret, and, and, and it was one of my most fun roles, too. It was great fun. <clears throat> Just my whole, you know, my whole demeanor, you know, when, uh, uh, well, ironically, one of my, one of my, buddies who's again name i cannot remember but we did a lot of looping together and he did an on camera on the show <clears throat> where he's uh walking around all the cars with a clipboard kind of doing a uh you know checking them out to make sure they're up to snuff and i remember i think that was linder i think that was the bike me line. no i can't remember where the bike me line came in but um it was fun you know, getting to act back and forth with him, who I knew, but, I, you know, I'm sitting there in the studio alone watching him on screen. So it's those kinds of crazy things that, that happen sometimes. It's like, wow, David. David is his name. Anyway, he had an on-camera role, and, and I loved I loved that role. It was a very sad day to hear that that show was canceled. Yeah, I thought it had a lot more potential, and it really was sad to see it end when it did, because I, I would have liked to see it continue on. I think the scripts needed to be better, the directing needed to be better, and it, I, I, I think it, it really deserved uh, a second season, and we all thought it was going into a second season. In fact, I'm standing here right now in my outside in my office, and I have maybe I'll take a picture and send this to you just for fun. Of, of a big poster that says, get ready to ride. <laughs> cool. And all the, yeah, it's pretty cool. The sun has faded on too much, but, uh, you know, we were on the cover of the season premiere of a uh, TV guide and it was very exciting. Now getting the role, this is good. I go into my agents. This is how regular, this is not a part of our little group of, of troop of actors. This is now going and auditioning. And your agent calls and says, come in, you've got to audition tomorrow or, or at, at 11 o'clock. Come into the office. You go into the office. There may be some other people waiting to audition for something else. Uh, you usually sign in, and then you're called in, and usually your agent, Dawn, isn't recording you. The, the, the right arm is rec doing the recording. And you might have 10 things to read for. You might have three commercials, a couple of promos, uh, one animated show uh, and whatever. Um, or you, and, and you don't always go into the agent. You might go to another, you know, like to the voice caster, uh, an outside casting place. Uh, but this was at the agents. And I can't remember the gal's name, but she recorded me and I did it. And, and, and you know, you don't, when you're working all the time, you don't pay any attention to these auditions. You audition and you leave. You know, you don't call the agent like an amateur. An amateur does this kind of crap. Hi, I'm just telling you about, um, that, uh, did I get it? <laughs> you know, that's what, you know, a, a, you know, a teenager does. <clears throat> you walk away. It's over. That's it. You don't pay any attention to the audition at all. You don't ask. You don't do anything. You got it or you didn't. And the chances are you didn't just get it if you got it. You got it, what's called a callback, meaning now they've whittled down 100 reads to 10 reads. And sometimes there's a second callback. You're down to the top three. Well, about six weeks later, Don calls me himself. And, uh... Don has a weird voice that's really cool, and he doesn't know to this day how or why his voice is the way it is, and neither did any of the doctors. He was a DJ in San Francisco for years called uh, Pit, Pits with the Hits, worth looking up. And he goes, hey, you know, you know uh, listen, those uh, fellas over at, uh, over at the, and he says the effing word a lot, over at the uh, effing blah, blah, yeah, they are. Uh, I want you to audition for this. Can you get in tomorrow at nine? I said, uh, Don, I have a job at nine. I had a looping session uh, just down the street from the agency. Yeah, yeah. Why don't you go, come on in about uh, eight fifteen, and we'll knock it out real quick. I said, but wait a minute. Is this for that Team Night Rider show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I said, but but they. I did that. I auditioned for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Okay, I'm confused. Yeah, well, you see, they didn't like anybody. Don, 
if they didn't like anybody, why am I coming in and auditioning again? You know, that's the effing point. They don't know what they're doing. So come on in. I want you to do it again just the way you did it the last time. How's that for smart? <laughs> wow. Guess who got the role? You. <laughs> yep. And I laid it down six weeks prior exactly the way I did it again. Wow, what an amazing story. Thank you so much for sharing. And I was, and Trent and I was in a hurry, meaning I had to be, I, there was no messing around. We did one slam dunk take and bada bing, bada bang, boom. And, and Don said, you know, let's, let's go ahead and play it back and make sure, let me just make sure I got it. I said, I don't have time. I don't, okay, quick. And it started to play. Yeah, he gave me a wave through, through the glass. You're good to go. And I raced over to my job. That was the end of it. Wow. Next thing you know, I got the call. He says, yeah, yeah, you know that show we, uh, we did? Yeah, yeah, you got the, you got the effing part. <laughs> wow, man. That's a crazy I'm story. Kidding. I love it. Are you kidding me? What? What? And it was pretty exciting because, you know, to land... To land an on a, a, a voiceover on an on a on um on an on camera live action show, that's a stretch. There aren't they, they are they are few and far between. Yeah, like that's that's the story of Team Night. Oh, and a caveat: you'll love this. The girl who played one of the cars says, "Oh, will you come and see my show?" my one-man show, and I'm like, you know, she's going out, and I'm going in. And I said, oh, Nia, yes, I'd love to come and see your show. I'll certainly come and see your show. And I didn't make it to her show. I had no intentions of going and seeing her one-man show. That would be my big, fat Greek wedding, and Nia Vavilos would be one of the speaking cars. Thank you very much if I played my cards right. I could be Mr. Vanellos. Well, that was a very good show. And I couldn't believe that she was one of the car voices because she really blew up, you know, in the industry. Um, but back then, I didn't know who she was when... Uh, well, when neither did I. Because <laughs> she wasn't. Because she wasn't. But, you know, there you have. I mean, there you have it. I mean, you know, I I, I should have gone and seen my big fat Greek wedding and... And then I maybe would have met Tom Hanks and his wife. And, you know, oh, dokey pokey. You never know. <laughs> you never, ever know. You got to go after every possibility because you never know what it'll turn into. You don't. You just don't. Well, Kerrigan, I just wanted to thank you so much for everything you've shared so far, and especially about the most recent story we were discussing with Team Knight Rider. <laughs> Well, everyone, that's all the time we have for this episode. I know it's sad, but we're not done. This is the end of part one. Stay tuned for Sunday morning to hear part two. Hey, do you ask yourself who did that voice? Well, if you do, go to our website, www.whodidthatvoice.co and click on the episodes tab. Choose an actor, pick their name, and see pictures from the different characters they voiced in their career. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you next time for more discoveries on Who Did That Voice.